is a Wicked Local series of blogs. Mike, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, right after Mike, we have Sam Byard. Sam's a fellow at the Berkman Center, and he's assistant director, works with David uh, at the Citizen Media Law Project. Sam's also a lecturer on law and the LLM program here at Harvard <coughs> Law School. Um, if you are familiar with the Citizen Media Law Project, uh, website, you know that they have a fantastic blog, and, and Sam's a, a frequent uh, a blogger on media law and intellectual property uh, issues of importance to non traditional journalists and others. Um, Sam was an associate at Wachtell Lipton and clerk for Judge Kaplan in the Southern District of New York. Thanks for joining us, Sam. Um, after Sam, we have David Haas. David's a partner in Goodwin Proctor's litigation department here in Boston and a member of its intellectual property group. David's practice focuses on trademark, trade secret, copyright, false advertising, and licensing disputes. And David represented the New York Times Company in the aforementioned case uh, brought by Gatehouse uh, at the end of 2008. David, thanks for joining us. Um, after David, we have Bruce Brown. Bruce um, uh, uh, came and joined us on about, I guess, 40 hours notice, <laughs> roughly, um, from DC as a partner at Baker and Hostel. And we're thrilled that he was able to make the trip. Um, Bruce's practice covers the areas of libel and invasion of privacy defense, copyright, law of news gathering. He has a long journalism background in addition to his legal career. He's been co-chair of the Legislative Affairs Committee of the MLRC in New York, and he's currently an adjunct faculty member at Georgetown's master's program in professional studies in journalism. Uh, along with some of his colleagues, including Bruce Sanford, uh, Bruce has published a number of pieces about news aggregation and related issues, including an op-ed that appeared in the Washington Post last May entitled, Laws That Could Save Journalism. And thanks again, Bruce, for coming, especially on such short notice. And finally, Joseph Liu is a professor at Boston College Law School. Joseph uh, writes and teaches in the areas of copyright, trademark, and internet law. He's a co-author of uh, the copy Copyright Law Essential Cases and Materials textbook published by West. And the particular focus of Professor Liu's work is how digital technology is changing the ways in which com consumers interact with copyrighted works, which I think is at the heart of a, a lot of what we're going to talk about today. Um, as I said, it's my goal to probably do as little talking as possible today. So I wonder if maybe each of you could start with a short statement about yourselves and, and, and what brings you here. Thanks so much. Mike, if you want to start. Thank you, Chris. And I, too, would like to uh, uh, join in thanking Chris Babbitt, <coughs> Jennifer Isbell, David Ardia, and the others at the Berkman Center for uh, organizing this event today. It certainly is uh, going to present some cutting edge and very interesting, uh, developing, fast developing um, legal issues. Uh, as Chris indicated, I chair the First Amendment in media law practice in my firm. Uh, these days, that means I spend an awful lot of time on airplanes. Um, uh, I'd like to think much to my wife's dismay, although I'm sometimes not certain. Uh, we do a lot of work in what I call traditional, uh, older media uh, types of claims, defamation, although those certainly can uh, affect internet publications as well, invasion of privacy, uh, and other news gathering and news publication related claims. Um, I would like to say that as somebody who has spent his entire professional career, and been privileged to do so, uh, representing the media and the working press, uh, I have always viewed uh, the fair use doctrine as not some grudgingly tolerated exception uh, but a fundamental policy uh, of the copyright law that is intended, and often does, uh, stimulate creative thought and authorship for the greater good and benefit of society. Uh, simply because I have taken the uh, pro-right holder view in a couple high-profile litigations, um, I will say for this group that my view has not changed uh, in, in that <laughs> regard. Uh, I'm sure we'll anticipate the uh, substantive discussion a little bit, but. Uh, and see if that can be squared up going forward. Um, the last thing I should add by way of uh, humor is when I told my children uh, that this was, was going to be uh, on a webcast, um, and I was walking out the door, they said, well, Dad, please, do us a favor. Just don't say anything really foolish. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I, I could not provide them that reassurance. So, um, I'm very pleased to be here today. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Hi. Um, oh. I'm Sam Byard, and I'm the assistant director of the Citizen Media Law Project. Um, so I'm sort of the in-house uh, guy uh, from the CMLP today. Um, and our, our sort of background on this um, and approach to it ha has been um, a, a concern uh, for sort of uh, the, the non-mainstream media um, journalist, the non-traditional journalist, the blogger, uh, the social media user, and, uh, uh, and, and, and we've been very interested in this topic of news aggregation uh, for a number of years, probably going back uh, uh, before the Gatehouse case, but uh, obviously our interest was spurred in that uh, at that point um, to sort of really engage with it. Um, and I, I think 
our orientation to the issue um, is that uh, um, uh, on the on the on the uh, copyright issue, on the fair use issue, we uh, we want to emphasize, I think that. Uh, that there are lots of different types of activities that, that are, are referred to under the label of news aggregation, uh, and that depending on what activities we're talking about, uh, the fair use analysis, analysis certainly um, should come out differently. Um, and that most of the more productive uh, uh, aggregation practices um, uh, uh, should, uh, under present law, um, enjoy the protection uh, of of fair use. Um, hot news is something we've become very, very interested in uh, recently, um, and in particular, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the interest in, in, in what impact the hot news doctrine, um, uh, if expanded and revived and applied to uh, the online, sort of the open internet that we, uh, that, that we enjoy today in the United States, what impact the hot news doctrine might have uh, on uh, uh, on that sort of vibrant uh, conversation that's going on and what the First Amendment implications are uh, for that expansion. Um, uh, and that's, uh, that's my take. We'll talk more. Oh, great. David? Um, thank you, uh, everyone, for coming. Thank you to those of you who are online. Um, and thank you for the center for putting this together. This really is uh, a lot of fun, and I've been looking forward to this um, for a while now. Um, in some ways, I think I may approach these issues a little bit differently than um, some of the other panelists and probably from some of the other folks in the room. I come to these issues not in a sense from a media or an industry perspective. Um, I really have spent my life as an intellectual property lawyer. Um, I, as a result, have been dragged into many, many different media disputes. and. Uh, including the New York Times case, and, and um, uh, I also represented Cablevision uh, at the trial level in the RSDVR case that they had against um, most of the media industry um, a number of years back that ultimately was decided the right way in, in the Second Circuit. Um, and so I, I really sort of do come, from, come at these issues from a, a very traditional um, intellectual property bent, um, and that's where my analysis tends to start. Um, obviously, that analysis can be um, seen through the prism of, of various different clients that I've had, um, and many of them are in the, in, in the media industry, including the New York Times and Cablevision, and um, uh, uh, some very interesting uh, clients um, who have been involved in publishing um, uh, and both as authors and as publishers, I represented Hamid Karzai at one point when he got into a, an odd issue over a book deal. Um, and uh, I also, in a sense, um, come to this from a, from a slightly different angle uh, in the sense that when it comes to watching um, the media world change <coughs> and content provision change, uh, I have a vested interest in it. Uh, I'm, uh, my day job is as a uh, lawyer. I'm also a novelist, and I've had four novels published around the world in nine different languages. And um, watching, uh, watching the industry change and trying to figure out how content is going to be protected um, and encouraged uh, is not just a professional interest to me, but a, but a personal interest. The latest book, by the way, is called Among Thieves. came out a bump, about a month and a half ago. <laughs> got great reviews. If you guys like thrillers, please. I need, I need the money, so <laughs> go on, buy it. Bruce? Great. Well, I guess I've been looking forward to this for about 36 hours. Um, <laughs> um, but it's great to be here, and it's great to be a sub, because um, clearly I can take a pass on the tough questions, because I don't have and to do any of the homework. Um, just to get my biases out on the table, um, I worked in, um, in, in print media before I went to law school. I worked for David Broder, Washington Post, for a couple of years, and then did some stringing for The Economist when I was in law school. And then after law school, um, I worked at uh, American Lawyer Media at Legal Times um, down in Washington, where I wrote about the federal courts. Um, uh, so I have a, a print media background that's going to give me a bias. My clients are in print media. That's going to give me a bias. Um, I'm not on Facebook. I don't have a Gmail account. Um, I've never been on Twitter. 
Um, my poet is still Yeats. My band is still the Beatles. I am clearly of the old century. Um, but saying all that, I love the internet, um, but I love journalism. And so one of the things that I've been working on over the last couple of years is trying to do some writing about what we can do in the way of public policy uh, to help journalism survive the transition to the online world. And when it comes to hot news, uh, my colleague Bruce Sanford and I, as Chris mentioned, uh, did a, a piece last year where we looked at some of the different things that Congress might be able to do um, to give